Yes, I, I was going to get up here, but, you know, Ken stole my thunder. It's like I was going to get up here and preach on the text about how Jesus got out his whip and overturned tables and everything else this morning. But in context, to defend what we are doing, which I don't have to, I know you guys, thank you so much for all that you are doing. I already see the pledges that are being done for, for our, sending our youth to youth camp. It's tremendous. Uh, you know, we, are gonna, we have a couple things that we do to raise money here, uh, and, and it's, for, it's for our children. A lot of what we do is that direction. And a month after this, we are going to look to send about 20 kids to kids camp. And uh, it's a little bit less expensive than youth camp, uh, but thank you for your support as a church. I believe this, that one kid... One child sent to children's camp or youth camp is a life that is changed. And you can't put a price on that. It is absolutely priceless. What I want to do is I want to open up with a, a little bit of geography here, a little bit of getting us kind of acclimated to uh, Jerusalem this morning. And, uh, you know, it's interesting, N Nathaniel Cheney, uh, Cheney, I, I know I have a I know a friend named Cheney, and and then there's Matthew or then there's Nathaniel Cheney. I'm always I'm gonna forever get those messed up, but anyway, we have a picture here of Jerusalem, and Nathaniel just got back is just getting back or just got back from Israel, his trip to Israel. So it'll be kind of interesting to hear what he has to say. If you don't know who Nathaniel Cheney Cheney is, he is he is our. <laughs> He is our um, youth intern, and he goes to Corbin. He's, he's going to be back with us. His dad, their missionary family, is going to be speaking with our, uh, at our uh, Father's Day uh, br breakfast and car show and all that jazz. Anyway, this is Jerusalem about the time of, of, of King David. And up there at the far right is the palace, and that's on Mount Moriah. And that's towards the top of that mountain. And just north of that, because this is actually um, taking, almost looking east, um, to the north of that is the field that uh, King David purchased where the Temple Mount in the temple is sitting at, or the Temple Mount is sitting at today. I just wanted you to see that, kind of to see the, before we begin to read the text, you kind of get to know what's going on. Look at the next picture. This is a picture of King David getting up from his nap, and you can kind of see what he is looking. He looks down over Jerusalem. Now let's look at the text this morning. Um, we're going to be looking at King David's funk. Have you ever been in a spiritual funk? Have you ever had a spiritual lull in your life where maybe you, you, you entered in a time in your spiritual journey that, yes, you believe in Jesus. Yes, you've given your life to Christ. And you simply have had that wonderful, maybe it was a youth camp experience. You had your high. Or, or you've given your life to Christ. And, and all of a sudden, you've gone through a time where, you know what? It's just not the same. You are kind of going through the motions. You've, you've, you've come off that spiritual high. And, and you get up each day. And you're kind of just going through the motions. You that spiritual lull. Or... You feel like maybe you're just faking it. Have you ever been there? Have you ever felt like in your spiritual walk you're just kind of faking it? Well, we're gonna, we've been looking at a series of people in the Bible, and this one's this morning is King David. And we're going to look at his, I believe, his spiritual lull in his life. Let's read 2 Samuel chapter 11, verses 1 through 4. It says this, In the spring... That at the time when kings go, go off to war. First of all, that right there is kind of a, a warning to the reader. He's setting us up here. King or David sent, I'm, I'm popping a lot in this. Is that annoying to you because it's annoying to me? I'm going to try to fix that. I may have to take this off. That's a suit hanger, I want you to know. Anyway, David sent Joab out with the king's men 
and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Amorites and besieged Rabbah. But David remained in Jerusalem. Right there, the author is telling us something, and we're going to get to that in a minute. Look at this next part, verse 2. One evening, David got up from his bed and walked around, walked on the roof of the palace. And I must confess to you right here, stop right here. When I was about 23 years old, when I first, uh, I, I got my first church and I was preaching on this one text, I, had, I thought I had done the, the best study I could, but I want you to know an error that I made, and I'm, I'm here to kind of apologize for that about just, you know, maybe 10 or 15 years removed. Don't do the math. And, and I remember preaching on this, and I remember saying to my, it was one of the major messages, it was one of the major points in my message, and that was, like, what's David walking around on the roof for anyway? What's he walking around on the roof for? What's he doing up there in, in, towards the evening? He's, he's walking around on his roof. There's the first mistake, so stay off the roofs of your lives. <laughs> that was one of the points in my message. Now, I thank the Lord that the people that, they, that God gave me at that time were very gracious and patient with me. <laughs> because I want you to know that that was a common practice at this time, as they walked around and there was the cool of the, the evening, they'd walk around on the roofs. It was just very efficient of space. Anyway, now that I have, you know, corrected the errors of my ways of my youth in ministry, let's move on because I have more room to make some mistakes maybe today, but let's hope I don't. Anyway, when he was on the roof, and from the roof, he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful. And David sent someone to find out about her. The man said, isn't this Bathsheba, the daughter of Elam and the wife of Uriah the Hittite? Then David sent messengers to get her. I mean, if you look at this, you go... This guy was really good. He goes, isn't that the wife of Uriah? Are you getting it, David? Then he didn't get it. Or he got it and he didn't care. What I want to look at, this, if you've ever known, look at, look at the timeline. King David is about 55 years old at this time. He's 55 years old. We're talking about 35 years removed. I mean, this guy was a giant killer. He was a military man. He conquered. He, he, was, he was at a wonderful time. You might look at this and say, he's at a wonderful time in his life. He's at a time where Israel has been conquering nations, taking cities. The Ark of the Covenant is back, is at Jerusalem. It sounds like everything is good. And the author here is telling us something. The writer, Samuel, is telling us something here about King David's condition. This is really strange that King David would not be with his military army, with his children that are in charge and working with the military, with his leadership. It, 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 they're, they have a city under siege. He is to be there plotting. He is to be doing what he has been called by God to do, to lead the people of Israel. And I believe that David is throttling back, that David is pulling back, that King David, there's something going on where he totally relaxes. Now, there's nothing wrong with pulling back and relaxing. We all need that but he did it spiritually. I almost wonder if maybe some parts of the psalm that he wrote doesn't go back to one of these moments. He was, it could have, he could be a month or two in Jerusalem while this city is under siege. And he is not doing what he should be doing. 
He's in, I believe he's in a spiritual lull. I believe he's pulling back. I believe what King David did is he took off his armor and he set it aside when he should have had it on and he should have been in battle. You know what it reminds me of? It reminds me of a passage of scripture where the apostle Paul says, put on the full armor of God. But David didn't do it. He took off his armor and he set it aside. Let's read Ephesians. And let's look how real this comes to life. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 through 18. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God, David. Don't take it off. Put it on so that you can be able to stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and against the authorities and against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, here it says it again, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, not if, do you see that? When the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after all you've done everything to stand, stand. Stand firm then, here it is, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. You look at this. What David did is he, he took off his armor. He took off his armor and he set it aside when he should have had the helmet of salvation on. If he had the helmet of salvation on, and if you could go to the next slide, I, I thank you. No. Oh, okay. This, this is great. No, go back one. Thank you. This is cool. Because I want you to know something. When I was picking out this, the armor of God and everything, I was looking some stuff up. I, I want to ask you a question. Which one do you think I chose? Actually, I chose the left, the far left one. I, 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 I didn't say everything that I wanted to say for you to ask me the right question, the right answer to it. Which one do you think Joel chose? <laughs> he, I'm looking through this, he goes, Daddy, I want you to pick that one. And so it was the middle one. But the actual one that's probably more practical is what David probably wore was the one on the far right. Anyway, now to the next. What King David did is he took off his helmet of salvation. You see, the helmet of salvation... It guards and protects our minds. It's our salvation. It's like what he did is he put his, his helmet of salvation off to the side. And he started thinking like the world. He, start, he didn't start thinking like a man of God. He started thinking like the man of the world. And then what he did is he, he took off his breastplate and he set it down. The breastplate of righteousness. And the breastplate of righteousness, what that does is that protects your heart. It protects the passions that you have. It guards, you know, the passions that we have, the things that we desire, the things we go after. Instead of the passion that he should have had, and that was to protect Israel and protect Jerusalem. And protect, instead, his heart and his passions were going all in the wrong direction, all in the wrong place. He needed his breastplate of righteousness. The next thing is he had... He took off his belt of truth. He needed the belt of truth. He needed the belt of truth that told him, Hey, King David, Bathsheba's husband's name is Uriah. That's the truth. You know her dad. You know her husband. That's the truth. That's the truth that needs to be buckled around your waist to protect you. Instead, he exchanged truth for his own lie in his own mind. The next thing 
as he took off, as he took off his sword, the sword of the spirit. One of the things about the sword is the sword is the only offensive weapon that the soldier has. The sword of the spirit. You know, it, it's so interesting because he took off his sword, but what the sword of the spirit. But what did he pray to God later? And we're going to get to that. He said, do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Interesting. He set it aside. Lord, don't take your Holy Spirit. It's the power of the Holy Spirit that gives us the strength to resist temptation. And what did he do? The next thing is the shield of faith. His shield of faith. I know that Paul is referring more to kind of the Roman era and the Roman generation than necessarily King David's. But it says that it extinguishes the fiery darts, the, the weapons. What they would do is they were made of wood. The, the shields were made of wood. And uh, the, the fiery darts would embed themselves into a, a, a kind of a retardant wood and would put them out. You see, our shield of faith, faith is what we believe. Faith is where our passions and our heart is and our belief in God. He didn't place his faith in God at that moment when he set his armor aside, when he should have been off doing what he was supposed to be doing as a king. Instead, he placed his faith in himself. And that doesn't work. Next is the feet fitted with the peace, with the gospel, with the good news. That's one of the things that's interesting about... It, it, I don't know about you, but I, my feet are... I don't know how people walk in gravel. You people that can just take off your shoes and walk across gravel, you guys blow me away. I can't do that. I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm just like this little wussy guy that can't, you know, can't make it across the, the gravel. I'm just like, I'm bad. I, can I, you imagine, can you imagine going into battle without your shoes on? You see, it's fitted with a readiness with the readiness to make your move, to move, to bob and weave in the spiritual arena that David's in right now. He needed to bob and weave in all the right ways, and he didn't. When I look at King David, and I see his situation. He wa his feet weren't fitted with the readiness of the gospel, the good news. He had his shoes off, leaning against the pillars of the palace, looking out over where he shouldn't have been. I think a lot of people want to, want to. A lot of commentators. It's real interesting. They kind of want to put some blame on Bathsheba, and and you know what? The responsibility in Scripture here lies with King David. He's the one. He's the one that had the authority. He's the one that had the position, and instead of being like Joseph, fleeing Potiphar's wife, he had the readiness. He had his armor on. But King David didn't. The next point of my message is King David needed a wake-up call. Now, I had a video right here. And I'll just tell you about the video. I, we're not playing it because it's not here. But it's like, anybody, anybody see the movie Groundhog Day with Bill Murray? He's, I had the video clip of him waking up, you know, the the. <laughs> his alarm clock goes off and it clicks over and then he gets to the point where he, he's bashing the thing every morning, throwing it on the ground. Can you imagine what, uh, what Nathan, the prophet, felt like when he goes and sees David? Can you imagine that? You wonder if he's like, please don't shoot the messenger. Don't kill the messenger. Don't do what Bill Murray did to that alarm clock. You know? Can you imagine that? But King David needed a wake-up call. The prophet Nathan comes knocking on King David's door. And he says this. He said, there is someone who was a rich man and there was a poor man. The rich man had cattle and he had sheep galore. And there was a poor man who had only had one. He had one. It was a lamb that he had purchased. It was a lamb that he raised. It was a lamb that drank from his cup. It was a lamb that 
fell asleep in his arms, this poor man's arms. It was like a daughter to him. And there came a traveler through town. Went to the rich man's house. The rich man didn't consider his own stock. Instead, he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the traveler. David heard this, and he was, it says that he was furious. He was angry. He was boiling and said, that person should die. That person should be paid four times what the lamb is worth. Nathan looks at him and says, you're that man. Wow. Now that's bold. Now that's a wake-up call. It's interesting how, you know, it's interesting how we, when we hear someone else doing something, that's really, really, really bad, right? Why do we not see our own faults? Why are we great to quick to judge someone else? At the very things that we are doing. King David, how do, you know, recognize our own faults are painful, aren't they? Aren't they painful? They are painful. In fact, you, because it requires change, right? And we don't like the change. Pain is, change is painful. And they say this about, about change and about motivation. They say that unless the present circumstances are greater than the pain of change, because changing is painful, unless the the pain of our present circumstances becomes greater than the pain of change, we won't change. And once they do, we begin to change. What I want to do is I want to look at four areas, four levels, or four steps that God uses, or, 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 or degrees that God uses to motivate us. I have a couple slides in here, too. Of, of there's, a, there's a white slide in here about, um, they'll get to it, about, Motivation. There we go. Uh, motivation. I just, it, it, how are you motivated? We're going to talk about that in a minute. Go to the next one. How do you like these kids? When I saw this, I go, now there's a motivated bunch, isn't it? How'd you like to have to motivate them? How does God motivate us? There's four, there's four steps. There's four levels, I like to say. Go to the next. There's four levels. The first one, the first level of motivation is... Have you, ever, have you ever looked at something and you're staring right at it and you can't read it? That happened to me right now. Ultimatum. The first thing is God can use his ultimatums. And the four areas that we're going to look at, you can find these in the Ten Commandments, the levels of motivation that God uses. These ultimatums are, are things like this. It's like, okay, if, unless you do this, I'm going to have to do that. That God gives us ultimatums. They're consequences. They're things that you see. Consequences. Um, it, what's, what's sad about this is that most of us tend to function on this level. It's, it's, the, it's the most rudimentary level of motivation that we have. But most of us kind of function like this. The best way to illustrate this is a person that worked. There was a company that had to have 100% people signed up to go, to, so they could get the health care. You know, like that work, it's like every, everybody has to sign on for this company to get their health care. And this one guy would not sign. He would not sign on to have health care, so nobody could get it. And all the employees were coming and saying to the guy, I said, listen, would you please, please sign this so that we can all have health care? My family needs this. And the guy said, I don't want to. Everybody talked to him. Finally, the boss invites him into the office and says, could you please sign this? He goes, I really don't want to. He goes, let me put it this way. If you don't sign it, you're fired. The guy pulls out his pen, grabs the piece of paper, signs it, hands it back to the boss, walks out the door. Everybody in the office, everybody in the whole plant is going, what did he say that he didn't? And the guy asked the guy, he goes, well, what did he say that we didn't? He goes, well, nobody put it quite like he did. You know, isn't that the truth? It's, it's, this is sad, but this is a lot of the, this is what David was functioning on, under this ultimatum type thing with God. 
The next level of motivation is incentive. We see this, incentive. In other words, if you do this, God will do this. this is the, we see this all through the Old Testament, and even in the Ten Commandments. If you do this, then God will do this. It tends to be a little bit more on the self-centered side. It's like, okay, what am I going to get out of this, you know? What am I going to get out of this? But that's a level of obedience that we do have. The next level is interesting. It's more practical. It's very practical. It's, it's, it's more on the level of functionality. In other words, it, it's, it's, it's like this. Um, okay, I've tried this 20 times, and it didn't work. I guess I need to stop doing that and do something else. Like, for example, I know God gives almost all these in dealing with adultery, but especially, adult, especially adultery, it really doesn't work, right? It just doesn't seem to work. Because we, we look at these, the moral laws and the obedience, and, and, and we look at this, and mostly the world kind of functions like this. If this, you know, you do, it's really sad is when somebody does the practical side, they do it 20 times, and they keep doing it 21 times, and 22 times, and 2300 times. And you wonder, you, you ask the question, how is that working for you? And it doesn't matter, they just keep doing it. Really, the highest level of obedience, the last one, is love. It's the highest level of obedience. It's relational. In fact, if you look at scripture, this is the really, uh, even the covenant that God made with Israel was called the covenant of love. It's relational. When you look at God's word and you see how motivated he is, the Ten Commandments, love the Lord. What did Jesus say? Love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your heart. It's relational. If we truly understand, I love what one pastor told me. He said, what God is saying to us is this, new light is delight. God truly, if, if you truly love God and he know that he loves you, then what you do, you do it based on the foundation and the premise of love. We have that, don't we, with our children, with husband and wife? That should be our motivation. Not like, you know, if you don't take out the trash, you're sleeping on the couch. You know, yeah, it may work, but the highest level is the level of love. You do it because of love. King David needed that wake-up call. And his level of obedience usually functioned on the lower part of obedience. Anyway, um, number three, King David prayed. He got to the place, point three, he got to the place where he prayed. And what I want to do is I want to close out this message by, I think, is one... You got where, where David was doing well, and then he took time off, and he got idle. He gave into temptation. He committed adultery with Bathsheba. I think some of the times we, we, what we do is when we read this text, we want to kind of focus in on David's failure and all of that. And, and, but I, you look at that, it, there's so much surrounding this that brought on this failure in his life. And then we're getting to the place where his where that spiritual funk that he went through, that God restored him. And I want to look at three key passages. In Psalm 51, as you read, kind of Paul, uh, or, uh, David's prayer, King David's prayer of repentance. I want to do is just look at three, and they're not even full verses. They're like the second part of one of the verses as keys to his coming out of his spiritual funk. And he prayed this in Psalm 51. You teach me wisdom in the inmost place. Think about that. Look at, look at what he did. Was it very wise for him to stay home? Was it very wise for him to do what he did? Well, no. There's, there's a whole mess of bad choices that he made. But what he's saying is this. His, teach me wisdom. I don't want to make these mistakes anymore. Teach me, Lord. I'm not going to go through all of this garbage. I'm not going to go through all of this mess. I'm not going to go through all of this and not learn anything from it. Tell me how you feel this morning. I know what I felt when I went through a time in my life where it was like just bad choice after bad choice after dumb thing after dumb thing and my life falling apart. I didn't want to get to the end of that and go, oh, by the way, I'm just going to kind of ignore it and move on and everything's going to be just fine. No way. I wanted to say, God, help me. 
What do I need? I don't want to suffer through all of this pain and problem and not learn anything from it. That's what David's saying here. Teach me wisdom in my inmost place. Look at, look at 5110B. It says this, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. You see what he's saying? He's saying that steadfastness, another word for that would be loyal. Renew that loyalty within me. I need to be loyal to you, Lord, even when I don't feel like it, even when I, wanna get, I don't want to get out of bed and go to church. You've heard that joke, I'm sure you have, you know. This guy is laying in bed and he's sleeping in and he says, I don't want to get up and go to church. And she, and, and she said, you need to get up, you need to go to church. He goes, I don't want to get up and go to church. And his wife says, you have to, you're the pastor. It's like, you know what, you do things out of loyalty. You do things, Lord, teach me the steadfastness. And the last one is this, Psalm 51, 12b, and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. You can look at his prayer, go read it, Psalm 51. You go read that prayer, and I'm telling you, these three verses are key, key verses. Because all the rest of it deals with the things, you know, he, just his desperation of prayer. But these are the key things that gives him a foundation to live his life moving forward. Lord, give me a willing spirit to sustain me. Have you ever had a will that wasn't very willing to do what God wants you to do? Wow. What did David say? Lord, give me that. I need that. Of just every head bowed. Every, every eye closed. You know, we all go through struggle. We all go through difficult times. We all go through times where, like King David, we want to take the armor off and set it in the corner, and we want to go take a nap. And rest is good, but don't pull back spiritually. Keep the full armor on. When the day of evil comes, you need to just stand your ground. Dear Lord, this morning I'd like to ask this congregation, is there an element in your armor? Is there a chink in your armor? Is there something that you've taken off and you need to put it back on? Maybe this morning you'd like to raise your hand and say, Lord, here I am. I need to get back in. I need to, I, I don't, I, I need to put the full armor on. I need to be in the battle. I need to be doing what I need to be doing. Let's close in prayer. Dear Lord, thank you this morning for all that you have done. Thank you for your word that is, that is sharper than any two-edged sword and that penetrate and cuts and, and reach to our hearts in a very loving and amazing way. Lord, may we rise up. May we not shrink back. May we put the armor on and throw our shoulders back and say, I'm in the Lord's army. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Join us in the fellowship.